Today we're going to discuss the female breast and GU exam. Um, I want to introduce you to some of the equipment that we need to have set up and prepared before we begin. First off, it's important to understand that we have different types of speculum based upon our patient's body habitus. Um, there are the graves. Graves are a much larger speculum. Um, if, uh, and of course they come in stainless steel, but graves speculums are a little on the larger side. The medium size is called the Peterson speculum. The Peterson is you can compare when you compare, right, with sizes. And then the smallest size uh, for adults, that is, is the, is the Huffman speculum. You can see that it is a different size. These are adult speculums, and of course there are a different set for pediatric patients that require something like a pelvic exam. This is a swab that we're going to use for our patient, and it's used to test for STIs. This swab actually comes with its own little white swab. This will be an endocervical swab. This goes within the cervix. We'll test within the cervix. It'll be more of a, when you put it into the cervix, it's just a turn with your hand, and then this will go inside our container. This is closed up, so this is one test for GC chlamydia. And then with an extra swab, there's two swabs. This is going to be in the vaginal vault itself. We'll go around the posterior superior fornix, and then this will go into the tube with its medium, this is broken off, and then this will go off to the lab. So there's actually two different collections, um, one's for GC chlamydia and one is trichomonas. So that will go off to the lab. We have our lubricating jelly. This is medical grade lubricating jelly. The problem with KY jelly, uh, unless it's specifically designed for um, a hospital setting, is that it can actually cause false negatives, false positives, or um, actually distort the findings on our cytology slides, right? So we always want to make sure that we're using a latex-free lubricating jelly that is hospital grade. We have, of course, drapes for our patient, which are very important. Drapes are extremely important for our patient's protecting modesty. We have a well and lamp that will go into our speculum. We're going to take out one of these sleeves. It's a perforation. And the sleeve is to protect our uh, lamp from any contaminants. So we kind of just drop that right into the, little, um, into the sleeve. If you notice that the lamp has a wide, it's wide one way and it's narrow on the other, it actually goes in in a cross typing um, insertion so that it'll stay within the lamp and it doesn't fall out, right? And this is our lamp for today, making sure that it works. So we'll set that aside. Real quick about the cytology kit. So this is a kind of an older type of cytology, but offices still use this, right? And this is where you actually have to fix your um, specimen or your sample to a slide. There's a glass slide that's in the case as well. It tells you exactly how, and great instruction on how to um, submit the cytology. So with the more of the spatula side, that is a side that we're going to take from the posterior fornix with this spatula. And once we gather our samples with the posterior fornix, and I'll show you on the model, um, it's a simple slide and then it's done. It's not really a movement like this, but it's more of a slide. Then we'll use the mitt, right? This is, this goes endocervically, right? And this slides around the exterior portion of the cervix in a round motion. This one is applied to C, just a simple smear. And then the last but not least is the cyto brush that goes endocervically. And then this is a matter of affixing it in letter E. It's just a matter of rolling that onto the slide. You have to take your cytology fixative pretty quickly. It needs to be done fairly quickly. We'll open it up and it's just like an alcohol swab. And then it's a matter of just squeezing this onto our slide to fix our samples. We'll add that to it to fix our samples, All right? Once that's completed, we'll fold it up, and this will go off to the lab. 
First and foremost, it's important that you introduce yourself to your patient. Most of the time, your patient's gonna be somewhat uh, anxious and kind of nervous about being in the office uh, for her annual uh, exam. So once we uh, introduce ourselves to our patient, um, you wanna address any concerns that she has first, um, any findings in the breast that might concern you or in the genital urinary area that may be of concern. Um, we also wanna talk about her past history. We wanna talk about her most recent breast exam and when it occurred. We also want to know anything about STIs that she may have had in the past. And not only did she have an STI, how was it treated if she remembers? And then did she complete the treatment? You want to know about her last pap smear, when it occurred, and what were the results of her pap smear as well. Once your patient's been, you know, she tells you about her medical history, don't forget the very important thing about, uh, especially with breast, in regards to breast cancers, are um, familial um, cancer risks, risks that could be happening uh, within the family. So I'd want to know all about her family's history in regards to uh, breast cancer. So initially what we want to do, what's very important is when we do the exam of our patient, um, first it's all about inspection. And inspection is done of the breast um, in a couple of ways, but the first and foremost, the most important to begin with, would be to have your patient sit up on the edge of the bed for us, right? So when she sits up on the edge of the bed, she'll actually drape. Now you notice that the gown has the opening in the front. We're gonna have our patients drape her gown around her shoulders so that you can get um, exposure of the chest, the clavicles, and the chest itself, and both the lateral aspects of the breasts, um, just below the xiphoid. You can keep this on her legs. As I'm looking here, the things that I want to know is I want to look at symmetry of the breast. I want to make sure that the breasts are symmetrical, that I don't see any outpouching or nodules, um, but it should be nice and round and contour, and they should be equal. Um, on exam, you'll notice that some ladies, their breasts are one size might be one side might be a little larger than the other, which is a normal variant. I'm looking for any discharge from the nipple area. I'm looking for any changes in the skin, like orange or roughness of the skin. I'm looking for erythema anywhere of the breast tissue and I'm also looking for dimpling in the breast tissue as well. So in this position is the seated upright position. The next position I'm going to have my patient going to is going to be hands on her hips and what I really want her to do is I want to really have her push against her hips so that it flexes the pectoralis major muscle and pushes the breast tissue forward and again, I'm looking for all those skin findings, again, the wood orange, the dimpling, um, any lumps or masses that are visible, and I'm looking for symmetry again. So hands would be on our hips. And then the next position would be our patient leaning forward. I want the breast to become pendulous, right, and hanging forward. And again, I'm looking for symmetry, right? I should expect the breast tissue to kind of drop into a bulbous type uh, tissue. And again, I'm looking for symmetry here. I'm looking for dimpling or anything, masses, or anything that would suggest that there's underlying pathology. The last one is going to be with my patient lifting her arms up above her head. Again, displacing that tissue upward and the breasts drop down. Um, again, looking for all those changes in the breast tissue. Once I have my patient inspected, I've watched, I've looked, and I've inspected her breasts, I kind of bring them back to the table while I'm back, and then I expose one breast at a time. So I bring the drape up onto the breast and I expose just the one breast that I want to examine at that time, exposing the complete breast. At this point, um, there are multiple different, there's linear inspections. Some people like to go in a linear motion. Some do concentric circles. I'm gonna show you the concentric circle method. And I start at the 12 o'clock position at the nipple line. And I, it's a matter of keeping my hand, one hand on her shoulder, but it's a matter of just displacing the tissue in a circular motion. The motion is about the size of a dime. And I wanna notice where my last finger laps so that my next finger, when I come around, will cover and I don't miss any of my, I don't wanna miss any of the tissue. So I'll come right around. And once I'm back at the 12 o'clock, I move up to the next layer and I start again concentric circles moving right around the breast tissue.
displacing the tissue. Once I've completed my concentric circles, the one thing I don't want to dismiss would be this tail of spins. It's very important. I want to make sure that I palpate this complete area for any nodules or tenderness masses. And then on my final for this breast, it's a matter of expressing the nipple for discharge. It's a matter of going this way, and then I just kind of move my hand this way. And then I would go to the other side. So once you've completed both the left or bilateral breast exam, the other very important thing, and we've talked about this in a couple of exams, are the lymph nodes. Most certainly the axilla will be a part of a breast exam. Uh, remember that we have the central, the anterior. There's the central chain, we have an anterior chain, we have a posterior chain, we have a lateral chain that comes down um, into the, the upper arm. And then we have the supraclavicular lymph nodes supraclavicular, and then there's infraclavicular lymph nodes that need to be palpated. We also talked about at the elbow, remember at the elbow, there's the epitrochlear node that we would palpate, right, for lymph. So once our breast exam is done, um, we also want to inquire with her, you know, about monthly self-breast exams. And it's not a matter of just inquiring about breast exams, but um, how does she do the breast exams? Um, also, you know, in the shower is kind of how I tell them that it helps with tissue, it displaces tissue, uh, soapy hands and a soapy chest. Most certainly the breast is easier to palpate for masses or tenderness, um, and that is a good way to do it. And that's a monthly breast exam. So once we've completed that portion of our exam, we're going to go ahead and explain to our patient about the pelvic exam. Um, information and communication is the key to dispersing some of the anxiety uh, that your patient might have. So I'm going to tell her how my exam works. I'm going to first take a look at all your, of the genitalia, and then it's going to be a matter of um, using a speculum. And I usually, if a patient's never had a pelvic exam before, um, I kind of show them the speculum and my instruments, and then I'm going to um, let them know that that's when, how I'm going to um, examine the cervix, and then it's a bimanual exam that follows. Okay, so important things here, actually have the correct lighting. Uh, my patient at this point is usually sitting up, and I'm going to have my patient to start lay back, lay back and I'm going to bring out the stirrups, right? Um, I usually extend them all the way first on both sides, and your patient will want to put her foot in one, which is fine as she leans back. Um, and then I help guide this foot in on this side. At this point, once I've got our feet in the right place, I want to make sure that I'm able to do the exam appropriately. So I'm going to move my, my stirrups out just slightly, right, with her feet in. Now, at this point, I've still got my patient covered, right? And these drapes are over the knee. And what I do is I start moving the drape up because I want to see where her bottom sits. To be able to use the speculum correctly, I really need her bottom to be almost off the edge of the bed. So I have, I usually put my hand right here and I ask her to just keep bouncing down towards me until you can feel my hand hit you, right? So she'll kind of do this bouncing maneuver, right? Until she gets into position, then I stop her. So now I have in the correct position and that's when I'll lift the drape, right? And it'll be up over her knees and then I'll cave in the center so that I can see her face because I don't want to hurt her and I want to see her response to some of my exam. So once I have my patient in the right position, I want to be able to see the mons pubis is an important area. I'm looking for hair distribution. If this is a pediatric patient, I want to mention my tanner stage for sure. Um, the lymph nodes, right, the inguinal lymphadenopathy. I'm looking for any swelling or ulcerations. I'm looking for nits and lice that could be in the pubic hair. Uh, again, we mentioned the distribution. And then once I come down, I'm looking at the prepuce. I'm looking at the clitoris. I'm looking at the labia majora, it's the labia minora. I'm looking at the perennial area, right? I'm looking for any discharge. I'm looking for any bleeding. Um, and then once I've gotten to this part, I will actually just use the side of my hands, actually the ulnar sides of my hands, and I'll just displace tissue this way, right? This is a hard model, 
but tissue will actually give way with a little mild pressure. And this way I can actually see better the folds of the labia, but most certainly the labia minora. And when I open my hands like this, I'll be able to see the clitoris better. I'll be able to see the urethra and the urethral opening. I'll be able to see the skein's glands, or at least the area in which I expect them to be. The skein's glands are just inferior to the opening of the urethral meatus. And then as I look lower or inferiorly, posteriorly if you're talking about, uh, but it could be posteriorly inferiorly, I'm looking for the, uh, the Bartholin's glands openings, which are just inside the labia majora um, on the posterior side of the vaginal introitus. So once I've finished looking for the Bartholin's glands, my next step um, at this point is looking for any discharge. I want to make sure there's no discharge or bleeding. Um, if it's a virginal patient, then there should be a hymen there um, in place, which would be just inside the introitus, we would have the hymen. And also have my patient bear down. And I'm looking for a couple of things here. With my patient bears down, I'm looking for any urine that kind of seeps from the urethral meatus, and that she has an incontinent um, issue. The other thing is I'm looking for any bulges that come from the introitus of the vagina. I'm looking for a rectocele or a cystocele that drops anteriorly from anteriorly out of the introitus or from the rectal region or posteriorly, it would bring, it would come out this way. That would be more of a rectocele. Cystocele's come this way, okay? So once my inspection's complete at this point, the next thing I do is palpation. So palpating, I'm gonna go up to the inguinal region. I wanna actually start palpating around the inguinal region. I'm feeling for any lymph nodes. Um, pulses are right here as well. I can feel for pulses equal pulses. Right, any tenderness or swelling um, on palpation. I'm going to use, I usually use my hand like this. You gotta get kind of creative, but so that I can open the labia majora on this side and introduce my finger inside the labia majora, this is where I'm gonna find the Bartholin's glands. Bartholin's are here, and without removing my fingers, I just kind of rotate my hand this way so I can get the, the left side, right, Bartholin's. And then if I bring my fingers just up like this, I can get the skeins on this side and then on this side, right? Just checking for any nodules, tenderness, masses, or abscesses uh, in those glands. So I tell my patient everything's looking good. I'm gonna get my, my speculum. Um, I'm gonna start the, your exam here. So when we start this exam, what's important is, you know, your patient really has to relax. So you, at, you just kind of guide your patient, you help her with her legs, because I mean, they're becoming more apprehensive and they're kind of scared in anticipation. So it's just kind of, okay, I'm gonna start the exam, you can just relax. What's important to understand about how to use these things, and it's kind of awkward for some, is that the non-dominant hand should be how we manage the speculum, because my dominant hand has to do all the work, right? I've gotta be able to spin the swabs, I've gotta turn the spatulas, so my non-dominant hand manages my speculum. On my speculum, before I introduce this into my patient, I wanna use my lubricating jelly on both sides, or I can use just warm, tempered water. Sometimes water is a better way to go ahead and lubricate these, especially if you're using more of the stainless steel type speculum. So I've gone ahead and I've put on KY jelly for argument's sake, but this patient, we're gonna go without it so you can just see what I'm doing. But the two fingers of my dominant hand will apply pressure downward, opening up the introitus, right? Relaxing the uh, pelvic muscle. And then I'm gonna introduce the speculum. Now notice that my speculum is not introduced like straight up and down, vertical. It's introduced at a 45 degree angle with just the tip. And that is to relieve pressure on the urethra um, as I'm introducing it. This applies too much pressure to the urethra at a 45, it's a much easier insertion. So once I insert that, I'll start rotating, my thumb will come up, and I'll start rotating the speculum open as I'm introducing the speculum. Once I introduce the speculum, the important thing is, is that I trap the cervix, almost like in the duckbill. I'm kind of capturing the cervix. Once I've captured the cervix, um, I'm in the right position. Everything I need to do is right here. Now, there's a, this is a tricky little piece on these plastic speculum. They have these little clamps that kind of open and lock your speculum into place. 
um, because this one's kind of a rubber tough one, it kind of wants to collapse it, but it kind of holds it in place for you. The key, the rule, the number one thing is to never move this hand in your exam. This hand never lets go of the speculum. It must always be on the speculum, right? Managing the speculum. So once I've actually captured my cervix, I'm gonna start inspecting the walls, the vaginal walls, they're rugated. They should be pink. My cervix, um, I'm gonna note whether that's paris or nulliparous cervix, the opening. I'm looking for discharge. I'm looking for any erythema um, or any um, swelling nodules, cysts that might be on the cervix. Once I've got my inspection complete, now I'm gonna go ahead and start gathering um, my samples. As I'd said before, um, I'm gonna use the spatula side and as I introduce it into the cervix, I'm going around the cervical um, wall near the fornix, the posterior and superior fornix, and I'm kind of just kind of scraping around those walls. Then I would apply this to my slide. And then with the little mitten side, the small end, the small thumb goes into the uh, cervical os and I gather my sample um, of the cervix, and then of course this is applied. The swab will actually go into this deep into the cervix, so it's actually the complete swab should go in the cervix, and it's a matter of a motion of turn, twisting it around, right? And then this will also go onto my slide. So once I've finished here, I've finished my gathering my samples for cytology, um, if I'm doing an STI screen, I'll go ahead and test that as well. Uh, but once I'm complete, so my hand becomes back up. I'm going to release this lock. And just as I went in to become at this 90 degree, I'm going to go ahead and as I extract the or remove the speculum and I'm turning, I should be at 45 degrees once again once I complete my exam. And I slowly let this close. The important thing to remember here, and it's, it's really kind of a device, um, is this slide here. This can get in your way, so be careful. Be cognizant of this little lock as you kind of move things around because it can actually move this completely apart. So be very careful of this thing. Typically, you do not even need to use this lock unless you're dealing with a uh, patient with a very large body habitus that requires you to open up, maybe even for a procedure, that you have to open the vaginal vault a little larger. But typically, we don't need to really adjust this at all. Okay. So once we're done with the speculum, there'll be a kick bucket close by, and it goes right into the kick bucket. And then I tell my patient, I'm always important, I think it's very important to always be able to tell your patient what your findings are as you go, the second days. Hey, everything looks uh, right where it should be. I don't see any bleeding or discharge. I get up from my patient, right, she's still in the stirrups, and this is where I tell her about the bimanual exam. Um, I let her know that there, I, I'm going to use both hands. Um, these fingers will be on the inside, this hand will be on the outside. If um, one of them is uncomfortable or causes pain, I want you to let me know. So with the drape still down, right, briefly I look down to make sure that I'm in the right place. I put my hand, I put my drape back over, but for demonstration purposes, my hands will come in like this. This hand lies just above the suprapubic region, but below the umbilicus. Um, and these fingers will actually go inside. Two fingers, and it's pointing towards me, the pads of my fingers first, right? And what I'm looking for first is as I apply pressure here over the area that I suspect the ovary to be, on the inside, I'm lifting with my fingers in the vaginal vault. My middle fingers are actually in the anterior fornix, and this hand is applying where I expect the ovary to be, and I'm trying to push the two together. I'm trying to capture that tissue together and see if I can't trap the ovary. So this is on the right ovary. Then I come across the top of the cervix, and I'm just over the uterus at this point. And again, I'm lifting up. I'm trying to bring them together. And now my left ovary is on this side and I kind of bring it into my finger, right? As that exam is done, this hand now is gonna rotate down. My hand just sits on her abdomen with my left hand, but this hand kind of goes down 
and I'm actually gently lifting. I'm lifting the cervix and I'm gonna pull down on the cervix and checking for any motion tenderness called cervical motion tenderness. And then I'm also kind of sweeping the cervix as I go around the cervix, right? So I'm gonna lift it, I'm gonna push down on it, and then my fingers will sweep around the cervix and I'm actually feeling for any masses in the fornices, okay? So once that exam's done, um, I let her know that, you know, do you have any pain? And she lets me know whether or not she does or not. If there were concerns during your exam, uh, maybe a rectocele or some kind of mass that you found on your posterior fornix, there would be a reason at that point that to do a rectovaginal exam. A rectovaginal exam is done where um, your one hand, your non-dominant hand, rests on the abdomen, and it's a matter of introducing one finger into the introitus, um, and then your middle digit into the rectum. And it's a matter of inserting the fingers, and then it's squeezing together in a scissor motion, and you're really trying to feel the pouch of Douglas, um, if there's any masses or collections there, or if there's any tenderness here. That would be a rectovaginal exam. And again, they're not routinely completed. It's usually whenever you, there's a finding there that would suggest there might be something in that tissue between the rectum and the vaginal vault. This hand, right, that doesn't have the jelly on it, I can now cover my patient back up. And then my gloves kind of come off in my hand, and then I kind of collect everything in one glove so that it doesn't um, cause contamination. And I put that in my drop bucket. Once that exam is complete, I asked you know, last time if there were any concerns or complaints or issues going on, um, and then that would conclude my female breast and genital urinary exam.